And now we begin chapter one of Hoot. Roy would not have noticed the strange boy if it weren't for Dana Matherson, because Roy ordinarily didn't look out the window of the school bus. He preferred to read comics and mystery books on the morning ride to Trace Middle. But on this day, a Monday, Roy would never forget. Dana Matherson grabbed Roy's head from behind and pressed his thumbs into Roy's temple, as if he were squeezing a soccer ball. The older, boy, the older kids were supposed to stay in the back of the bus, but Dana had snuck up behind Roy's seat and ambushed him. When Roy tried to wiggle free, Dana mushed his face against the window. It was then, squinting through the smudged glass, that Roy spotted the strange boy running along the, the sidewalk. It appeared as if he was running, hurrying to catch the school bus, which had stopped at a corner to pick up more kids. The boy was straw blonde and wiry, and his skin was nut brown from the sun. The expression on his face was intent and serious. He wore a faded Miami Heat basketball jersey and dirty khaki shorts, and here was the odd part, no shoes. The soles of his bare feet looked as black as barbecue coals. Trace Middle School didn't have the world's strictest dress code, but Roy was pretty sure that some sort of footwear was required. The boy might have been carrying sneakers in his backpack if only he'd been wearing a backpack. No shoes, no backpack, no books. Strange indeed on a school day. Roy was sure that the barefoot boy would catch all kinds of grief from Dana and the other kids once he boarded the bus, but that didn't happen because the boy kept running, past the corner, past the line of students waiting to get on the bus, past the bus itself. Roy wanted to shout, hey, look at that guy, but his mouth wasn't working so well. Dana Matherson still had him from behind, pushing his face against the window. As the bus pulled away from the intersection, Roy hoped to catch another glimpse of the boy farther up the street. However, he had turned off the sidewalk and was now cutting across a private yard, running very fast, much faster than Roy could run, and maybe even faster than Richard, Roy's best friend back in Montana. Richard was so fast that when he got to work out with the high school track squad when he was only in seventh grade. Dana Matherson was digging his fingernails into Roy's scalp, trying to make him squeal. But Roy barely felt a thing. He was gripped with curiosity as the running boy dashed through one neat green yard after another, getting smaller in Roy's vision as he put a wider distance between himself and the school bus. Roy saw a pointy-eared dog, probably a German shepherd, bound off somebody's porch and go for the boy. Incredibly, the boy didn't change his course. He vaulted over the dog, crashed through a cherry hedge, and then disappeared from view. Roy gasped. What's the matter, cowgirl? Had enough? This was Dana, hissing in Roy's right ear. Being the new kid on the boy bus, Roy didn't expect any help from the others. The cowgirl remark was so lame it wasn't worth getting mad about. Dana was a well-known idiot, on top of which he outweighed Roy by at least 50 pounds. Fighting back would have been a complete waste of energy. Had enough yet? We can't hear you, Tex. Dana's breath smelled like stale cigarettes. Smoking and beating up smaller kids were his two main hobbies. Yeah, okay, Roy said impatiently. I've had enough. As soon as he was freed, Roy lowered the window and stuck out his head. The strange boy was gone. Who was he? What was he running from? Roy wondered if any of the other kids on the bus had seen what he had seen. For a moment, he wondered if he'd really seen it himself. That same morning, a police officer named David Delinko was sent to the future site of another Mother Paula's All-American Pancake House. It was a vacant lot at the corner of East Oriole and Woodbury on the eastern edge of town. Officer Delinko was met by a man in a dark blue pickup truck. The man, who was as bald as a beach ball, introduced himself as Curly. Officer Delinko thought the bald man must have a good sense of humor to go by such a nickname, but he was wrong. Curly was cranky and unsmiling. You should see what they done, he said to the policeman. Who? Follow me, the man called Curly said. Officer Delinko got in step behind him. The dispatcher said you wanted to report some vandalism. That's right, Curly grunted over his shoulder. The policeman couldn't see what there was to be vandalized on the property, which was basically a few acres of scraggly weeds. Curly stopped walking and pointed at a short piece of lumber on the ground. A ribbon of bright pink plastic was tied to one end of the stick. The other end was sharpened and caked with gray dirt. Curly said, they pulled him out. That's a survey stake, asked Officer Delinko. Yep, they yanked him out of the ground every day in one, probably just kids. And then they threw them every which way, Curly said, waving a beefy arm. And then they filled the holes. That's a little weird, the policeman remarked. When did this happen? Last night or early this morning, Curly said. Maybe it don't look like a big deal, but it's going to take a while to get the site marked out again. Meanwhile, we can't start clearing or grading or nothing. We got backhoes and dozers already leased, and now they got to sit. I know it don't look like the crime of the century, but still. 
I understand, said Officer Delinko. What's your estimate of the monetary damage? Damage? Yes, so I can put it in my report. The policeman picked up the survey stake and examined it. It's not really broken, is it? Well, no. Were any of them destroyed? asked Officer Delinko. How much does one of these things cost? A buck or two? The man called Curling was losing his patience. They didn't break none of them stakes, he said gruffly. Not even one? The policeman frowned. He was trying to figure out what to put in his report. You can't have vandalism without monetary damages. And if nothing on the property was broken or defaced, what I'm trying to explain, Curly said irritably, is it's not they messed up the survey stakes. It's them screwing up our whole construction schedule. That's where it'll cost some serious bucks. Officer Delinko took off his cap and scratched his head. Let me think on this, he said. Walking back towards the patrol car, the policeman stumbled and fell down. Curly grabbed him under one arm and hoisted him to his feet. Both men were mildly embarrassed. Stupid owl, said Curly. The policeman brushed the dirt and grass burrs off his uniform. You say owls? Curly gestured at a hole in the ground. It was as big around as one of Mother Paula's famous buttermilk flapjacks. A mound of loose white sand was visible at the entrance. That's what you tripped over, Curly informed Officer Delinko. An owl lives down there? The policeman bent over and studied the hole. How big are they? About as tall as a beer can. No kidding, said Officer Delinko, but I ain't never seen one officially speaking. Back at the patrol car, the, the patrol man took out his clipboard and started writing the report. It turned out that Curly's real name was Leroy Brannett, and he was the supervising engineer of the construction project. He scowled when he saw the policeman write down foreman instead. Officer Delinko explained to Curly the problem with fi filing the complaint as vandalism. My sergeant's going to kick it back down to me because technically nothing really got vandalized. Some kids came on the property and pulled out a bunch of sticks out of the ground. How do you know it was kids? Curly muttered. Who else would it be? What about them filling up the holes and throwing the stakes just to make us lay out the whole site all over again? What about that? It puzzled the policeman too. Kids didn't usually go to that kind of trouble when pulling a prank. Do you have any particular suspects? Curly admitted he didn't. But okay, say it was kids. That means it's not a crime? Of course it's a crime, Officer Delinko replied. I'm saying it's not technically vandalism. It's trespassing and malicious mischief. That'll do, Curly said with a shrug. As long as I can get a copy of your report for the insurance company. Lease will be covered for lost times and expenses. Officer Delinko gave Curly a card with the address of the police department's administration office and the name of the clerk in charge of filing the incident reports. Curly tucked the card into the breast pocket of his foreman shirt. The policeman put on his sunglasses and slid his patrol into his patrol car, which was hot as a brick oven. He quickly turned on the ignition and cranked the air cooling up full blast. As he buckled his seatbelt, he said, Mr. Brannett, there's one more thing I want to ask. I'm just curious. Fire away, said Curly, wiping his brow with a yellow bandana. It's about those owls. Sure. What's going to happen to them? Officer Delinko asked. Once you start bulldozing, I mean. Curly, the foreman, chuckled. He thought about the he thought the policeman must be kidding. What owls? He said. We'll stop there.